All right, so this is the last uh, session, actual session. Before that, we um, move to the panel later. Um, and um, yeah, and then after the panel, we'll go for dinner. I, I hope everybody's going to stay for the panel, because for one thing, by the way, um, if you think you would have one question for uh, one of the speakers uh, that were here today, because as you've probably read on the website, the panel is going to be with all the speakers from today. That means uh, uh, Mike, Artwin, Ken, uh, Alex, and those two guys coming now. Then um, please go to the, um, the front desk, and there, are, there is a pile of, of, of paper, small, tiny, 10 by 10 papers, and write down the question in a readable uh, manner for me. Um, and um, yeah, I'll see. I I've prepared a lot of questions, so I don't know if I will, uh, how much time I will have left. But maybe our question crossed. Okay, right. The, night, the next guys are the guys from Worldcraft. And since they are a localization guy, I, I, I thought I would put out a, a French way to describe them. In French, we have a common word saying double pâté patachon. It means two people going together. Uh, and uh, I know those guys since uh, actually we, we know each other from the Macoon, most probably. Yeah. And um, yeah, and, 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 and they have a pretty amazing picture. Wow. Where, uh, they won. Uh, they went to a WWDC, and yeah, we we we've known each other for a while. For me, um, localization is a very uh, important part of this conference, and because it's international, it says it's here. Because I am international, actually, I don't even remember where I am from, because I'm so mixed. Um, that I'm super happy we have a, a non-technical, but at the same time technical talk by Felix and Oli. So please welcome them on stage. There's no stage, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Felix. Hi. And I'm Oli. Hello. I'm glad that at least some of you attended for, for a non-coding or whatever uh, talk. We're um, basically, we are linguists. We're not really into development or something. Uh, and we run a uh, localization service, but that's not the stuff we want to talk about today. Um, and we uh, sometimes face the question, there's just emails coming in saying like, oh, help, I just, I just noticed that I need to do localization, and it, sometimes it reminds us of a kind of a, a, uh, a doctor being asked, okay, I have a kind of a sickness, I now need some, some cure, and at, at best, yesterday evening. So our title is localization, uh, you, should, uh, you should have seen me on Dr. Sen. Um, we're doing it in turns, so yeah. we have kind of a, a chapters or stages or whatever. And um, basically, I'm wearing the green shirt. That means I'm the good guy, and I will. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that he's the bad guy, <laughs> but uh, basically, I will I will talk about what to do, and Oliver is going well, mainly not exclusively, but mainly talk about what not to do. <laughs> We leave that open Main, to mainly, mainly, yeah, mainly. Mainly. It's okay. yeah. So yeah, sometimes localization ends up like this, and uh, you certainly do not want to end up like this. So um, we will start with the kind of the grand picture. Um, when I look around here, um, I guess there are many people around who are still remembering the times when software shipped in boxes, in cardboard boxes, burned on CD-ROMs, and um, the development. Uh, process was kind of different back then. Well, it's not really back then, it's just two years ago or three on, on the Mac. Yeah, three, yeah. four, five, something like that. Um, so, here we go. Here. Um, so, the, the cycle was, was a little bit more relaxed. So, you would, you, would do, you would have an idea or you would start a project and start, start coding. And when you're done, you would, you would look to, to, to find systems or uh, resellers or whatever um, helping you sell your software. And typically, you, you would start uh, with the distribution in your country first, or, or in just one country, and, and then uh, look how, how it goes and whatever, and then think about um, international sales. So uh, you would then typically uh, look for, for a distributor abroad. And uh, in many cases, localization um, was a topic uh, coming up then. And in many cases, the distributor uh, offered help to do the localization. 
um, because they were in the country and they would have resources to do that. So it wasn't really anything you would have mu you would have much to do with. Um, so in the end, you would you would distribute your software internationally, and um, yeah, that's the past, I guess. So uh, yeah, just yeah, move on like that. Um, today. Uh, things have changed, and you uh, you develop your application, and then you would have the App Store, and in the App Store, um, the rules are a little bit different. Um, you would you would finish your or almost finish your your development, um, then maybe localize your software and then sell it on on the App Store. But on the App Store, it's uh, it's not like looking for a distributor abroad and thinking about it and discussing translation or localization issues. You're just looking at this. And it's quite amazing if you think about it. So, how many, how many of you know how, how many countries that are? Anyone an, an idea? How many countries? Pardon? Oh, pretty close. It's uh, 156. So when when submitting your app, you're, you're presented with that sheet, and then and many many developers then kind of flash and say, "Okay, I will will I sell the software everywhere, or will I have it localized first, or what what shall I do now?" And this is always the point where where uh, where we are asked for help, or very often. So yeah, I think yeah, your turn. Yeah. I think so. Uh, just let me go back to slides again. Um, the thing with the uh, development uh, process and uh, thinking about localization uh, in the development process and starting late uh, might cause quite severe issues, actually. And um, the thing is, well, you tend to develop uh, an app, and if you've put so much hours of work and blood and all this stuff uh, into your project, and you really want to get it out and get it done quickly, you've spent hours of debugging and uh, chatting with better testers and all this stuff. Um, so, well, from our experience, there's not very much time for localization to be done. Because they all want to get their, their app out quickly and all this stuff, but if you think about localization at the end of your development process, that might cause trouble, and I'm the bad guy. So yeah, I'll just let that go through again. Um, and I'd like us to take a look at um, what the localization process or workflow would actually uh, look like if you only consider localization at the end of your development phase. So, okay, here we are, we're the developer, and we've got an app, and we're thinking about, okay, I want to have my app localized. So, well, you choose your translators, there we are, we've got five translators here, and, well, you send the files to the translators, your resources, strings files, zip files, or whatever. That's pretty clear, okay, so let's see. A few translators may have questions, and um, you take a look at these questions and, and answer these questions and then think, oh, hey, why did only three of them ask these questions? What about the rest? What about the two? Are these answers relevant for them as well? So, basically, you answer all translators. Yeah? But, one batch of questions isn't enough. You always get more questions. So, again, you need to answer all translators. And now, we have that quite often, actually. One of the translators is coming to the developer and saying, well, you know, your string design is quite good and it works well in English, but I'm sorry, I can't translate it into Spanish, French, German, or whatever. It just doesn't work. We're going to into detail about that later. Okay, and so you think, well, okay, I need to fix that. And generally, from our experience, that takes about two days, because maybe, maybe you're, you're busy with debugging or, um, you know, um, having, <laughs> having a nice afternoon on your terrace or something like that. Um, so that adds up to the time as well. 
So basically, okay, you're finished, you are done with changing the strings, you think, okay, that's, that's pretty clear now, the translators can go on. We send out another batch of files to the translators. Um, and we had that in several projects as well. Basically, the, the localization was finished, we, we delivered, and the developer said, oh, fucking shit, I forgot two strings, I need to get that out to the translators as well. Um, now you don't want this workflow, actually. That's not good. What you should do is consider localization consulting as early as possible in the development stage. Now this doesn't mean um, very much effort, actually, but basically uh, you should think about looking for proper translators to um, give the, the early resources to and uh, let them have a look at your resources and uh, just get feedback into what's possible and what's not possible. And that's on that topic. How the heck do we get there? Because we do not really want to end up with a 20-day localization cycle. Yeah, exactly. maybe, maybe you had a specific date you wanted to release on or something and then somebody tells you, ah, I don't think the localization will be finished until two weeks. So that's maybe something you can avoid um, at the very, very early stage. So um, basically we just need to get rid of all this stuff here. Yeah. Uh, five days is just kind of a comparison to 20. Um, as every project is, is kind of an individual thing. But you, you can reduce the, the amount of time needed for localization and your personal nerves as a developer by a huge amount. So what, what, what you're trying to do is by talking to people early, um, native speakers, people you know, who know a foreign language or whatever, you can really get a lot of those arrows and whatever out there and have a real nice and smooth localization process. So the aim is to get the workflow as simple as possible and as efficient as possible. So by just having a look at the nifty details, they're not much, but they're very important, um, you can save a lot of time and nerves. And you can sum that up by, um, by starting early and talking to people. That's the main thing it is about. Yeah. They're cleaning up. <laughs> yeah. So, as Oliver said, um, talk to people early. That's, that's really, really important. Um, people may, may report back to you that, that, the, that the translations of the strings you're using will not fit the interface. So, um, then you would have some, some feedback on it and you can change the interface or, or, or the, the text or the string you're using. Um, that's up to you, um, there, there's no real rule about what, what, what to prefer, but at least you can fix it before actually diving into the localization. Um, same applies on the string design, we'll dive into that quite shortly. Do you guys understand me up there with the noise outside? No? Okay. Yeah. Is better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, you will receive feedback on, on UI issues. Um, we, have, we have a small example here. It, it's, it's, it's a very basic application, but it, but it shows um, what tiny thing to change can save a lot of time and nerve. For example, we had the, the buttons up there, and quite obviously French text or German text or Spanish text uh, would never fit in there, or you would have to abbreviate the words that much that nobody would understand you anymore, what you actually mean by those buttons. So it so it's, was well, it's kind of a very basic and, and uh, uh, yeah. Sure. I, I think maybe, you, maybe we should get the point. Yeah. By, by just redesigning the, uh, the UI, you can, um, you can avoid those UI issues right before uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the actual localization process starts. But again, in this case, we did it uh, during localization. So we had to get back to the developer saying, oh, we're sorry, we can't fit that in, you need to change stuff. So, yeah, yeah that took two days. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, string design, this, this is maybe a term sounding like, okay, there, there's design in language or something. This is, this is not what's meant here. 
It's just the way you write your strings. Um, for example, you see, you see an alert there by a very popular app, and it says that a contact you've, you've, you've been communicating with has sent you an audio note. So uh, this worked like on, on the strings files, this worked like that. You had a placeholder and which, would use, which would be used for the contact, uh, sent you an, and then you would have another placeholder being filled with an audio note or image. That works in English because the in in front of the, the second placeholder is always the same. Because all the English words start with a with the vocal. It's like audio note and uh, image. But if you if you are trying to localize this, um, that, that just doesn't work. Because um, you cannot you cannot be sure that in all the languages you want to translate that application in. Uh, this simple, um, let's say, lucky incident, I suppose, I don't, know, I, I don't really know, but I suppose, doesn't work anymore. And if you notice that during the localization process and you have to change your strings, this is just maybe a very tiny bit, but it means that you have to change the strings file being translated and send it out again, and maybe there, there are other questions arising from it, so maybe this tiny little bit can, can cost you a day, because maybe your translators are somewhere abroad in a very different time zone, and you have, have to wait until, whatever, 12 hours to hear back from them. So, by addressing this issue early, you, you can avoid this problem quite easily. Talk to people who know the language it should be translated into, and, yeah. And you would get feedback. For example, in German, the problem would be that, um, the audio note and image translations would have difference in translations in front. So that just wouldn't work anymore, as I said. So what, what you do is quite simple. You put the indefinite article, this is what the in is called from a linguistic point of view, you put that into the placeholder. And then you can just get rid of the problem because all the translations for image or, or uh, audio note or video or whatever would carry their own um, uh, indefinite article, the in. Or you can just uh, use another technique and say, okay, I, I have one string for each of them. This is the easiest way to do, but it, it makes uh, your strings files quite lengthy. It's actually the most convenient uh, way to do because this way the translator instantly knows what's going on inside that yeah. string. But it makes files lengthy. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, this is another thing. Um, here, uh, in this alert, um, the, the application doesn't know the gender of the contact. So, um, it cannot say share his location or her location to you. So, what they did is they were using there, and this is a kind of a way to do it, but from a linguistic point of view, this is kind of a language hack. And you cannot really be sure that this hack would, would work in other languages as well. So, the best thing uh, to do is not to do it. Um, so, there's another thing. Um, is it your turn now? No. Yeah? No? no? no. Okay. Um, <laughs> when, when doing your strings files, you have to be sure that people know what you have been thinking when writing those, those resources. Um, and you know that, but you cannot expect people to look into your head. So, um, use the comments quite extensively to explain what the string does. And if you use placeholders, how the concatenations work, and uh, where the string is used. Is it on a button? Is it kind of a label? Or where is it used? Because that, that carries a lot of information. All of those carry a lot of information for the translator. Uh, for example, what, what words to use, which translations to use, or how much space there is. Um, or typical translations um, in, in, uh, uh, which need to be consistent with Apple terminology. So, um, just use the comments to, to tell people um, what your text and the, and the individual elements do. Here we have, have a string that doesn't have a comment, and the problem is that this string is telling users that the service doesn't work anymore, but it will be back online or whatever, fun functional by a specific time, and this is the placeholder. But what is it? Is it a time? Is it a date? Is it a word like tomorrow or in two weeks or something? So you just do not know that when translating that string. But the translation uh, or the translator needs to know that in order to provide a correct translation. So, placeholder can be anything. 
So quite a short comment line can help a lot here. Just like saying the ETA is local time, everybody knows what, what to write because you know what to expect. And, and you're just fine. Um, here's another small example um, where, where the problem may not be so obvious because um, in English it's pretty, pretty simple. You can say, okay, you, you sent an image and you got an image and it's, 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 uh, it's always you. Um, as foreign grammar can be quite complicated, you cannot really provide that, that people know how to translate you because it, in, in, depending on how it is used, it can be different words. So um, by those typical uh, small strings, especially in one word strings where you cannot have any context from the text surrounding it, um, it's, it's pretty useful to have, have a small comment line saying, okay, um, this is used here for this purpose. Um, as I said before, uh, always explain the string concatenation, um, especially one of those. Because, okay, you, you might say, okay, these are placeholders, they do not really have to be translated because just the string is being used in the placeholder needs to be translated, but maybe you have to change the order of them. Can happen um, in foreign languages. So, you, first thing you have to provide the possibility to change their order, and second, um, you have to tell the translator what they are used for because then the translator can decide, okay, does the order need to be changed or not? Um, some little keywords in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a comment line can be quite helpful as well. Um, this, is, this is kind of very helpful if you know the app for it. It, it says an activity because an activity is part of one of the main elements of that app. Um, so, by, so by just saying, okay, the activity, when someone comments, Cinemagram is the user created, blah, 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 helps a lot to translate string. Um, another very important thing which I mentioned before is tell the translator where a string is used, uh, especially for UI elements. Is it a button? Um, is it a label? Like highlighted here. Because people know how much space there are and if there is specific terminology they have to use. The button, label, title, whatever. Now we're going back to the bad guy, right? <laughs> so I told you what, what would be very beneficial to do, and Oliver is now telling you what you better should do. Yeah. Okay. Um, we had quite a few examples of um, developers <laughs> thinking, okay, well, I'm doing an iPhone app and I'm doing an iPad app, um, which are basically the same. So. Why should I not use a unified strings file? Hey, one strings file for both of the apps. Well, pretty good idea at first sight, but when it comes to localization, this can be problematic um, because this is a VNC app for, for the iPhone. Um, when you find yourself with um, not that much space on an iPhone and you need to translate uh, such strings, um, you will often come up with abbreviations and, uh, um, well, yeah, just, just to, to fit it in there, basically. But when you use the same exact strings in the iPad app, you've got that much space on there. And you've got the abbreviations in there as well. But again, two thirds of the space left. So you could have written it out fully. Why don't you? So, this is, this is a good example of, please, use two different strings files. Now, what you should not do, I just, just mentioned it, um, don't use unified XIPs without auto layout. This is a mess. Don't use Google Translate. <laughs> And don't take anything for granted. Um, language is so diverse. We have different writing directions, different calendars, fonts, units, um, punctuations, and all this stuff. Um, there's good Apple documentation and WWDC uh, sessions as well. Um, take a look at those. Uh, look for internationalization. Um, 
this is very important stuff as well. Um, okay, right, we're coming to marketing aspects now. Um, basically, there's one thing, do or do not. There is no try. So if you want to translate the app, do not only translate the app, but do the app store text as well. Do the keywords at least. Because especially the app store text is what the users look at. If they see an app store text in English, they automatically assume that the app is, in, is available in English only as well. They, they, don't, they don't search for this tiny little column saying, oh, this app is available in English, Spanish, French, whatever. It's the App Store text they look at, and, and it's the App Store text they make assumptions on. Oh yeah, I forgot the screenshots as well. And, very important, be consistent. If you address the user, address the user consistently. Now, informal address, formal address, whatever you feel appropriate, um, do it consistently. Um, even Apple doesn't do it. Uh, the, the German iTunes cards, they are totally inconsistent. Um, be consistent in style, in terms as well. If you use one term in the app at one point, use it every single time. And especially be consistent on the translational language expectations and the information you get to the user. Um, if, the, if you have a localized app store text, but you don't have a localized app, well, say that inside the, the app store text, because otherwise you'll get plenty of bad reviews saying, oh, you know, the app store text is localized, why isn't the app localized? I thought it was localized. Again, it's the, the assumption the users make from the app store text, um, so make sure you inform the user well. And Bear in mind that after sales texts are equally important uh, to pre-sales texts. Now, this is a, a very difficult issue because, um, well, many developers ask us, you know, what, what should I do with, um, with support requests, you know, from foreign, foreign users? What should I do with them? You know, I can't speak French, I can't speak Italian or whatever. Um, but what you, what you could do as a compromise is basically um, take a look at your support requests, um, grab those 10 most important requests you've got and have them translated, put them on the website or into tutorials inside the app or whatever. Um, it's, it's a very cost-effective way to make sure you get the, the, the major issues you know, out of your way. If you just mentioned on the extra text of what our, our, our product website that, that you are very happy to, to provide support, but that you, you only speak two languages, no, nobody will be mad about it. What people get mad about is that they get the impression that they have a localized application and they imply that you speak their language and that you can help them in their language. So, so the disappointment is not that they can help them in Italian or, or in Spanish. But that they, but that they uh, had a kind of a um, disappointment because they just assumed it would be like this. So just say it. Say, you're, you're, say that your application is not localized and you just have the, uh, uh, the uh, extra text is localized. <laughs> or, if uh, I might add that, if you have a localized app store description and you do not really use a localized screenshot, but are pretty easy to date it, so I don't know if you can the screenshots again. Maybe ask someone for, for some specific content you, you need on the um, People are just clicking it from the App Store and you have about three or four seconds to make them buy your app. Um, sometimes they have just been, this is a pretty lame example, but they have, have been searching for a Twitter time and just instantly scroll down to the screenshots out there and they go, no, I don't want this. So it doesn't really help that, that you have a, a localized description and that the app is localized. Because they have just been looking at the screenshots, and this is maybe what we think will be consistent. So, okay, um, let's play choose an approach. Um, if you want to localize your app, there are several ways to do it. Um, but basically, it comes down to this: you can get translations cheap, good, and fast, 
and you can choose either two of those. So what options have we got? Well, um, you could use volunteers. Now, users saying, oh, I really like your app, I'm French, I can translate that into French, let me do it. Um, they are cheap, they are highly motivated at first, um, but what happens with updates? Well, what's their payment? Well, generally, they, they ask for a license. So once they've translated their 1.0 and they've got their license, you know, that's it. What happens with updates? You know, maybe they say, oh, no, I'm not interested anymore, or I'm on holiday, I don't do it anymore, whatever. So you're there, you want to get out an update, fully localized, and you can't. Um, you can't be sure about their skills, the response time, again, motivation declines, and do they have test devices? Do they, do they know what to do with that app? Option two, you could use individual professionals, like professional translators. Um, they've got a, a graduation degree or whatever, they've got high translation skills, they've got quick response time, um, and they're reliable when it comes to updates as well. Well, obviously they want money. Um, you can't be sure about their experience either. Um, as I said to, to some of you last night, uh, especially to the speakers, um, the translation market is uh, quite Windows-based, so um, especially when it comes to Mac applications, you can't be sure um, if they know what they're doing. Um, again, you have high management efforts. You remember the workflow I put on there earlier. Um, you have to deal with every single question from every single uh, translator individually, and send them out back again and all this stuff. Um, and again, you're not sure about test devices. Or option three is using a localization agency. Um, there are some specialized agencies out there. Again, you get the quick response time, a high throughput, and they do the localization management for you. However, there's a downside, obviously. They want even more money. Um, and they sometimes have limited flexibility. Uh, there are quite a few cases where um, developers have got quite uh, individual uh, aspects and needs, and uh, those agencies can be limited in uh, uh, flexibility to get to know your needs and, and uh, get them done correctly and all this stuff. Yeah, and in addition, even localization, you have, uh, we call it localization seasons. So you can imagine, uh, it's quite obvious that when it's, when it's uh, December and everybody knows that I can take those shut down and everybody wants to have his update on the, on the store for uh, Christmas sale, um, that everybody wants localization. So, um, yeah, it can happen that people say to you, um, we're, we're sorry, we're, we're booked for at least eight weeks or something. So, Again, think about it early and ask early. Yeah. Well, basically, these three options are, um, well, basically, you, what, what you want to do, how you want to, to approach localization. Um, you know, many of you might have experiences with one of these options and uh, have done quite well with this. So, um, if it works, just stick with it. There is a fourth option, which is crowdsourcing. Um, we're not going into detail about this because uh, um, it's quite a lengthy issue worth a, a keynote itself. Um, so yeah, I hope we could manage to get some information to you. Well, um, we've been speaking about several things about now what, what to do, what not to do, um, talking to people early, and um, to sum it up, you guys remember that, and I think we can be sure that this sucks. Nobody wants that. You're, you want to do your code, you want to do development, and you do not really want to, to deal with that. Um, so um, to sum it up, there are some pretty, pretty small things just to remember. Um, think about it early. Uh, ask people, knowing the languages you want to translate into, what they think about your UI and your, your strings you've been using. Um, be consistent on the App Store, do the text, Either do, do it all or just don't do it, or at least say what you have been done. Uh, and when you're done, you should, you should uh, give yourself some minutes and see the product from the customer's perspective. 
does this look like my mom can use it? And if you say, okay, I want this, you should really check if someone else's mother who doesn't speak English very well as, or, or, or uh, maybe um, this is accessibility, but this is something we can talk about maybe later on this evening. Um, can the user use it as you intended it to be used in your development language? Yeah, so I think we're done. Yeah. We hope we gave you at least some, some very basic um, help here. Um, I think we're open for questions or later. Like to. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks. <laughs>actually we have time for one question just uh, uh, as maybe you've seen uh, uh, Felix's microphone um, has a problem so I will go back to you if you need to speak thank you um, my question is about um, what you said uh, you well um, I'm Karen Pierre from Paris um, uh, you, you said um, uh, that we should localize uh, the, the interface, but also the app store text. The problem is that there is um, some languages where uh, you, there, there is uh, not the possibility to, um, to put uh, localized text on the app store, for example, Arabic. Um, so what should we do in this uh, situation? Because um, I tried to use the, the screenshots to, to put a screenshot in English and one in Arabic, but Apple deleted the one in Arabic because it was in the... Yeah. So, um, I, I, I can just say this app is also uh, translated in Arabic, but I, I can't think of anything else more. Do you have any ideas? Oh, you, well, you could have, you could have a link on the app for description for the small product website. No, you can't, I think. I don't, I don't think you can put links in the app store description. Okay. Uh, but but you could tell people. Is it working again? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, you always have this this button: more applications from this developer or the developer's website or the product's website. So um, you could you could then try to have the same content on a specific website for that, hoping that people who are really interested in your app click on the button and yeah get the information from there. But again, I think the the screenshot approach is uh, quite quite a good good way to do it. Yeah. Sure. Because this is this is this is iTunes Connect limitation, so yeah, it's not much you, you can do about it, or otherwise then file a bug. Just a simple addition to that. Uh, remember that not every uh, language has the same left-to-right script, and you might find hilarious bugs in your user interface when confronted with an up-to-down script or right-to-left. Um, Twitter clients are very happy to show this if you find people who mix left to right and right to left scripts within a single tweet and what the user interface of different applications does with that. So you might want to take care if you use one of these languages. Yeah, good point. Okay. More questions? Good. Otherwise, there is a, there is a big uh, a bigger break this time, so uh, it's the last break before we go to the panel. So if you have questions for Felix and Oli, they will be in this um, special area. And yeah, and and we'll be back here. Uh, it's a longer break again, so we'll be back uh, in uh, um, about half an hour, probably a little bit less, for the panel with those two plus the other four. Give them a round of applause. Thank you, guys.